This you can really call a fish story. And I was the live bait. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Intercontinental Marine Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment in San Pedro, California, investigating the loss of two pieces of property insured by you. Or the tuna were running and so was everybody else. Or I caught a fishing boat, but you should have seen the one that got away. Expense account item one, $176.87. Airfare from home base in Hartford to off base in California. Expense account item two, $10. Cab fare, Los Angeles Municipal Airport to the waterfront office to the Pacific Deep Sea Canning Company in San Pedro. There was perfume in the air, channel number five. Inside, the name on the door said Walton. That's who I wanted to see, so I walked in. Well, who are you? I'm here to follow up the claim you made to Intercontinental Marine Insurance Company. My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, would well, you bring the money? I need boats. The tuna are running. No, Mr. Walton, I didn't bring any money. All I brought is a suspicious nature and an inquisitive mind. What the devil do you mean by that crack? I don't get your fish in a stew, Mr. Walton. This is standard procedure. No insurance company is going to shell out $400,000 without first taking a long, lingering look. Well, there's not much to look at. Yeah, so I understand. According to your claim, two of your boats, the, uh... Oh, here. The, uh, Frank Walton and the Nancy Walton left port Monday afternoon and headed out in a southerly course. When you tried to establish radio contact Tuesday morning, you couldn't raise them. Pieces of wreckage and the bodies of two men were found Tuesday night, indicating that both boats were lost. That's the story. What made you so sure that both boats went down? Because of those two men whose bodies were found, one sailed in the Nancy Walton, the other sailed in the Frank Walton. What more do you people want? Just enough time to check everything thoroughly. You know, this wouldn't be the first time a shipwreck has been faked to collect insurance. Uh, let's see what you mean. Yeah, I guess the faster I get you satisfied, the faster I'll collect my money. Sorry I lost my temper, Dollar. I'll do everything I can. Send Captain Carpo in. Carpo's my fleet captain, Dollar. He can give you all the details. But I'm telling you, there aren't any more. Well, one thing for sure, Mr. Walton. We can't blame it on the Pacific Ocean. According to my report, those boats sailed in fine weather. That's right. Me, boss. Yes, uh, George, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He's here to investigate the sinking. So? I'm happy to meet you, too, Captain. What do you want? First, I want your theory as to what could have happened. I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe they run into each other. As fleet captain, you hire the hands for the boats, don't you? That's right. Are you the kind of man that would hire the kind of skippers that run into each other in clear weather? They were good skippers. Now you listen to me. I've been captain of this fleet for five years. First time we ever lose a boat to lose a man. You think we like this idea? No, I don't, Captain Carpo. I don't think you like it. Any better than the insurance company likes the idea of losing $400,000. Well... At least if I find those sunken boats, that'll be salvage. No, Mr. Dollar. That'll be miracle. The meeting busted up without me getting busted up, which was uh, unusual in itself. And I hitched myself a ride out to an outfit who knows more about salt water than a Coney Island taffy maker. The U.S. Coast Guard. Enclosed, find the statement of the commander of the station, Lieutenant Senior Grade Miles P. Endicott, Jr. We've made thorough patrols using both air and surface craft. The bodies of the men recovered show signs that lead us to believe that they were blown clear of the lost ships by violent explosions. 
All the lieutenant needed to say to make my eyes light up was that one word, explosion. Because in a marine insurance investigator's book, the word explosion sets off another word, scuttling, the widely used wet variety of fraud. In other words, blowing up your own ship to collect the insurance. And continuing this chain reaction, I found the best available lead, the man in charge of the vessels involved, Captain George Carpo. I found him at 11 that night at a combination restaurant and bar named after the oriental fishing bird, the Cormorant. As I looked in through the greasy window, an interesting sight greeted me. Captain Carpo slipping into a booth already occupied by an olive-skinned brunette who was good enough looking, but uh, obviously less than a queen. Carpo stuck his face in hers, spat a few words at her that I couldn't hear, shook his sledgehammer fist at her and stomped out through her back door. I gave the front door some business and, trying to look like I belonged to the place, strolled to the bar, bought myself a blast, and walked it over to the ladies' booth. Well... Who sent for you? Do you mind? I haven't got anything to lose if you haven't. What do you mean by that? If those are your own teeth, maybe you don't want to lose them. Oh, Carpo's a jealous time, huh? You don't believe in sharing the wealth. Are you Carpo's girl? What time? Who are you? Well, if Captain Carpo comes back, he'll tell you anyway. Tell the name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Investigating what? Marine life? Uh Uh-uh. Marine death. There was two sinkings in the Walton fleet. The company that sent me here insured the boats. Sounds to me like you got yourself a tough job. Why? Oh, I don't know. Who are you going to ask questions? They've been reported up with all hands lost. Who knows? Maybe I'll bump into a talkative seagull. Or uh, maybe, if I'm lucky, a talkative girl. What have you got that could make a girl talkative, mister? Well, discounting my natural beauty and charm, I have money. Not too much money, but money. Keep coming. I know enough not to talk before I give what I want. Well, that makes it a Mexican standoff. I know enough not to pay for something I haven't heard yet. Let's start out with an inexpensive question, like, uh, what's your name? You can have that for free. Anita Vargas. How long have you known Carpo? If you'll pardon the expression, on and off for the last six months. How's he for money? Has he turned into a big spender recently? <sighs> sure. Instead of two drinks a night, he's now buying me four. Carpo will never be a big spender. Where does he live? 1423 Parade Street. How far is that from here? It's here. He lives upstairs. That called for a change of scene. I didn't know whether Anita Varghese really had anything to sell or not. But I didn't want what was left of our tete-a-tete to be interrupted by a violent re-arrival of the mighty Captain Carpo. So, expense account item three, four dollars. Picking up our tabs. Item four, six bits, picking up a taxi, which dropped us at another bar. Slightly less oriental, but definitely more obnoxious. We grabbed ourselves a table with a view, a view of the sawdust on the floor, and waited for a waiter. He didn't come, but somebody else did. The owner of the lost fishing boats, Mr. Roscoe Walton. What are you doing with this character, Anita? I met him in college, Roscoe. Now beat it. Since one of you been getting drunk? Don't tell me he's your boyfriend, too. Uh-huh, part-time. Maybe I'd better get lost. Uh, I'll call you later. Yeah, maybe you better get lost. And stay that way. Go ahead, Johnny. You better go. Well, uh, happy hangover, Mr. Walton. You don't look like no college boy to me. I was no professor of mathematics, either. But I could add this much up. If those tuna clippers had gone down by explosion, somebody had to buy some explosives. Maybe locally. That problem I took to the local police, who went to work looking up names in the dynamite register. And since those explosives would have been planted while the boats were under the care and supervision of Captain Carpo, that problem I decided to take to him. It was 1.30 in the morning when I got back to the front of the Cormorant restaurant and bar. The grease joint was dark but a light was burning on the second and top floor. I got halfway up the front stairs to ask my leading suspect a few questions about explosions when I heard something. Carpo was still moving when I got up there, but not for long. 
The back door was as open as the captain's life was closed. I looked down the back flight of stairs. It was either too dark, or there wasn't anybody there, and I wasn't going down to look. I'd been over the body just to make sure. Oh. First they beat him half to death. I wonder why they didn't finish him that way. Huh? Well, sir, perhaps it would be best if you were to remain where you are. At least my pistol seems to recommend it. Well, well, you seem to have done inestimable damage to my good friend, Captain Capo. The poor fellow seems to be definitely dead. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... You might be interested to know that CBS has acquired a couple of blocks of wood. You're not interested? Well, would you be interested if you knew that those blocks of wood had been carved into certain figures? No. Well, then let's try this. Uh, would you be interested if you knew that those carved blocks of wood could talk? Ah, now you're beginning to sit up and take notice. Well, we might as well come out and tell you that these talking blocks of wood are named Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. That they and a lively fellow named Edgar Bergen will be making their first appearance over most of these same CBS stations this Sunday evening, and that you'll be able to hear them every Sunday thereafter. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. There I was again. Always the suspect, but never the tried. With a dead body at my feet and a pistol at my head. The man holding it was neither small nor large. Thomas Mitchell type. His frame was fighting the seams of a sloppy tweed suit. And his pouchy face was fighting the alcoholic content of his blood. Well, sir, what do you have to say for yourself? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I came to talk to this man. Killing him would hardly be the way to kick off a conversation. How about you? What are you doing here at 1.30 in the morning? <laughs> Most amusing, most. Two accused men, each of them judging the other. Ha <laughs> With a dead man for a jury. All right, then. As for my testimony, my name is Cricket. I was on my way to discuss with the good Captain Capo a matter of possible mutual profit. Naturally, when I heard the shots from the street, I hastened to his assistance. I won't ask you how you knew Capo was getting shot instead of doing the shooting. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator from Hartford, Connecticut. I was sent out here to look into two sinkings in the captain's fleet. Oh, then you and I share a common interest. My business is ship salvage. <laughs> it's obvious that I should put up this pistol and replace it with a shake of a hand. <laughs> How do you do, sir? In my business, you never know. How do you do? This is indeed a most fortunate meeting. Uh, a pity that it should take place upon the very threshold of tragedy. <laughs> Poor, poor Capo. His face seems to have enjoyed the worst of an encounter with a monkey's fist. How's that? A monkey's fist. I mean, what's that? Well, a monkey's fist, sir, is a highly complicated knot woven about a slug of lead uh, to lend weight. Ordinarily, it is intended for use at the end of a heaving line. However, it is sometimes used by seamen in the forecastle in the administering of torturous beatings. Now, what do you make of that? Well, if we can take the word of the centuries for it. Torture suggests the violent seeking of information. That would indeed seem to be the case. Uh, from the looks of this room, a monkey's fist or any other kind of knot wouldn't be hard to lay your hands on. What's that one on the wall there? Oh, that, uh, that uh. is a miniature of a knotted ship's fender. Fender? Uh, it's a device for cushioning the shock between a ship and a wharf or another vessel. Uh. In modern sailing, this type has largely been replaced by the commercial cork variety. Uh -huh. Oh, Somebody evidently heard the shots and notified the police. <laughs> Awkward. Uh, look, Mr. Cricket, yeah? I feel like talking, but not to the police. Uh, splendid. <laughs> Perhaps then you would be kind enough to uh, join me in a nightcap at my quarters? Uh, lead me to it. <laughs> Mr. Cricket's quarters turned out to be afloat and moored to a dock. It was a PT boat, ex-Navy. <laughs> Sit down, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Right. Now, first, uh, uh, that nightcap. 
Yo, ho, ho, sir, and a bottle of rum. Aha. And now, uh, if you'll do the honors... Delighted. I will invite the London Symphony to play behind our chair. Tchaikovsky, the pathetic, oh, utterly beautiful. Well, sweet phonograph records, soft lights, and hard liquor. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I enjoy in my time off, which this doesn't happen to be. Hey, there we are. Now, now to business. Mr. Dollar, I assume that the insurance company that sent you out here is not uh, satisfied with the story of the sinking of the two vessels, Frank and Nancy Walton. Mm -hmm. I assume further that you have been authorized to spend any necessary monies to not only view the evidence firsthand, but also if that evidence proves a criminal intent to be able to retrieve it from the ocean floor for use in court. Are my assumptions correct? They are. But uh, it can't be as simple as you make it sound. Uh -huh. The first job seems to me the toughest, finding the spot where those clippers went down. Uh -huh. I, I would venture to say that with my special equipment, I could detect the presence of the fillings in Davy Jones' teeth. Uh -huh. It is fantastic, sir. And uh, about your price, is that fantastic too? My proposition is this. A flat price of $5,000. And in the event that criminal intent is proved, the possession of the recovered hulks. I assume this 5000 is only payable if you succeed in locating the boats. <laughs> Let us substitute the term returnable for the word payable. I will need $5,000 in advance, and our contract shall state that in the unlikely event of failure, you shall get your money back less my necessary expenses. Agreed? Agreed. Good. I'll have your money for you in the morning. Good. I trust I shall have your boats for you in the afternoon. I couldn't tell yet about his fantastic sonic sounding device, but uh, otherwise, Mr. Cricket was well equipped. By ship to shore telephone, he ordered me a taxi, which I ordered to a corner near Roscoe Walton's Pacific Deep Sea Canning Company. Carpo's death made me want to get a good look at Carpo's office. Something about the way he died kept baiting up the thought that there was something fishier about this case than just plain old-fashioned insurance fraud. The only thing that was out of place in the place was under a rug, under Carpo's desk, a wall safe sunk in the floor. That proved easier to open than a poker hand with three aces. I lifted the heavy steel door. The first thing I saw was an oblong package, brown paper, stuck one hand in to lift it out, and I couldn't. So I used two, and my back was as heavy as lead. But when I tore off the wrapping, I saw that it was as valuable as gold, because that's what it was, a gold ingot. I didn't even have time to wonder, because the subject suddenly changed from lead to gold to cold steel in his void in his hand. Hold it there. Hey, Mr. Dollar. Oh. It's a little late to be canning fish, isn't it, Walton? Yes, but it seems to be just right for breaking and entering. What are you doing here? Entering the last phase of this investigation, Walton, and breaking the back of your little racket. Or I should say big. What do you mean, racket? To me, it looks like your boats have been bringing in more than fish from the Mexican coast. This heavy little handful makes it look like they've been hauling in Mexican gold. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to stand here and be accused. You're so right you're not going to stand there. Not on those feet. Give me that. You and take this. Oh. oh, Johnny. Are you hurt? Are you kidding? You'll never make a living being a fight referee. I'm what is commonly known as the winner. Johnny, do, do you really believe what you said is true? What about smuggling in Mexican gold? Yeah. Listen, Anita. When you find a private citizen with a gold ingot, he is not using it for a watch fob. The only thing I learned after that was that two hours in the sack does not constitute a good night's sleep. By 10 in the morning, one phone call east and one telegram west delivered $5,000 into my hands from a local bank. And I, after a quick call to the Coast Guard to cover a few final details, placed myself into the hands of Mr. Cricket, deep sea guide extraordinary. Two jolting hours later, our bucking bronco with a briny had us crashing to the swell somewhere off the island of San Clemente, which is somewhere some 60 miles off the coast of Southern California. Well, 
your daughter, my boy, enjoying the voyage? Yeah. Ha oh, ha, come now. This isn't what a sailor would call rough weather, you understand? Uh, I understand. I only hope my breakfast does. Oh, this is nothing. Why, I recall one time off the Spanish coast. Mr. Cricket! Yes, my man? According to my reading, we're about there. Good, good. Reduce your RPM. Now, now, Dollar. Now, prepare to be amazed. Mr. Cricket had good reason to chirp about one thing. He sure knew his business. An hour later, the hoax had been located. We were riding on a mushroom anchor. A diver had been put over the side and was tug award topside by a cable on a winch. All right, careful now. Okay, clear the rail. He thinks that's it. Far away. He's a board and flat. Quickly, quickly now, get his helmet off. <laughs> now, Dollar, we shall see, we shall see. For 5,000 bucks, I'm going to have to see. <laughs> well, Riley, what luck? We hit it right on the nose. They're both down there 30 yards apart. <laughs> well, Dollar, are you satisfied? Just about 90%, Mr. Craigett. Oh, and the 10%? Well, oh, look, it's this way, Mr. Craigett. If this case gets any place, I'll probably have to testify in court. So far, everything I've got is secondhand. That isn't worth much in court. I've got to see those boats. What? Why, good heavens, man. You, uh, you mean you want to go over the side? I don't particularly want to, but it seems to be part of this job. Many times before in my career, I've thought I had a heavy weight on my shoulders. But that diver's helmet set the new record. And those lead shoes and that rubberized canvas suit didn't feel exactly zoot. The temperature of the water outside felt much cooler than that forming on my brows. This was a steam bath, fair tight. Eight days later, in my mind at least, my lead wedgies broke for a foothold on a slimy bottom, and I had arrived ship's side. As I had no immediate way of determining the sex of a sunken ship, I couldn't tell from a bath to beam whether I was looking at the Frank or the Nancy Walton. About then, a passing current grabbed me and invited me out to dance along the ocean floor. I grabbed out for anything for support, and it turned out to be a rope hanging from the clipper's gunnel. Well, Dollar, when the drift bottom. passed on, the hut, all right? I had a chance to take a closer look at what I was hanging on to. The line was secured to a woven rope ship's fender which Mr. Cricket had not so long before told me was fashioned about a buoyant core of cork. But this one felt heavy enough to be loaded with county cork. And as for buoyancy, this was about as buoyant as a lead balloon. Dollar, it was resting right on the bottom and heavy to lift. There? The next current that swept over me was mental. I clawed the shark knife out of the diving suit belt, started hacking at the woven rope, Dollar, come, come. then through a thin layer of canvas. And that's as far as I got. Dollar, is this phone system operating? Here now, Dollar. Are you there? This ain't the three little fishies. Oh, good. Have you seen the ships? Yeah, they're here, all right. Are you satisfied that they were soaked by explosion? Yep. They're blasted in all directions. Then I have earned my $5,000, and I must bid you farewell. What? What are you talking about? Oh, oh. You have been all but lost in a diving accident. Oh, ho, yourself! What'll that get you? In disposing of you, sir, I am confident that as well as pocketing your $5,000, I will also do away with the meddling of the insurance company. You see, when my diver comes down to recover your unfortunate body, he will continue our search for the gold. Oh, well, I've got news for you, pal. You evidently didn't knock the hiding place out of Carpo before you killed him. But I was lucky. Not only have I already found that gold, I have stashed it. Here now, Dollar. You're bluffing. If you think so, turn off my air. Ah. So you do know about it. Uh, Dollar, tell me honestly, are you open to terms? Well, uh, I'll think about it. All the way! The 
trip up was slower than the trip down, which was luck for me. The first thing I heard when I broke to the surface was muffled by the helmet, but unmistakably gunfire. The Marines hadn't landed, but by George, the Coast Guard certainly had, and I had a grandstand seat for the whole affair. My winchman was busy ducking bullets, and the winch just didn't decide to stop on its own hook. So I went riding skyward until I was stopped by the tip of the boom. And there I was, hanging on its own hook, suspended over the deck, looking through my helmet glass at the raging battle below. Cricket directly below me was pumping a high-powered rod right, and between shots, shouting curses at whoever had opened fire on the U.S. government. Lieutenant Senior Grade, Miles P. Endicott Jr. stood silhouetted against the sky on the flying bridge of the Coast Guard cutter. I looked down 20 feet between my dangling lead-weighted feet and saw Cricket taking careful aim in his direction. So once again, I grabbed my razor-edged shark knife, stuck it under the copper rim of my breastplate, and ripped at the canvas, and bombs away! My weight did the rest! Expense account, item five. Cab fare to the San Pedro Police Headquarters where I made my statement and heard Mr. Cricket, a badly damaged Mr. Cricket. Well, sir, during a short stay in Cleveland, it was brought to my attention that every city in the country was suffering an epidemic of small-time gold robberies, dentist offices, pawn shops, and so forth. Such a condition piqued my curiosity. Yes. Well, there's my love for money. And I studied the situation more closely. To my amazement, I learned that the gold was being melted down, fashioned into ingots, and sent off somewhere to the Orient for use in the gold and gun smuggling traffic. It occurred to me that if I could intercept the gold immediately after its dispatch, under the guidance of Captain Capo, to a larger ship, being met at sea by his tuna clippers, and I could realize for myself a tidy profit. Expense account, item six. $7.50, a five-pound box of chocolates for Miss Anita Varghese. Address, San Pedro Municipal Jail. It seems that the police sometimes classify a part-time girlfriend as an all-time accomplice. Expense account item seven, airfare, Los Angeles to Hartford, $176.87. And uh, being Friday, what do you think they serve for dinner on the plane? What else? Tuna fish salad. Uh, expense account total, $1,264.28. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Willard Waterman, Junius Matthews, Edmund McDonald, Georgia Ellis, Larry Dobkin, and Paul Dubois. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure and be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Every fall, the ladies like to go out and get some new fall clothes. Well, CBS has gone out and gotten some new fall shows. One of the gayest of these new programs is the Red Skelton Show, which makes its bow over most of these same CBS stations this Sunday night. There's no one quite like Red Skelton, as you'll find out when you tune in tomorrow. The Red Skelton Show is a part of the CBS great Sunday night laugh lineup. Don't miss it. Now stay tuned for Vaughn Monroe who follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>